In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. A rhyme that has long been taught to America's schoolchildren about how Christopher Columbus sailed across the Atlantic on his three ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Found the Americas, made friends with the indigenous people, and returned to Spain in glory having discovered the New World. But there's something just a little off about the story. Columbus wasn't the first to discover the New World. Leif Erikson and the Vikings beat him there five centuries earlier. And long before either of them, indigenous people had already been living there. Besides, Columbus never even set foot in North America. He explored the various Caribbean islands. And while he was there, he was totally convinced he found Asia, not America, calling the Native Americans Indians. But there's no denying, Columbus is a legendary explorer and navigator. And his daring voyages had a massive historical impact, sparking the great age of Atlantic exploration, trade, and eventually the colonization by the Europeans. But let's not shy away from the rest of the more complicated picture, in which Columbus seems more like a monster who initiated the two greatest crimes in the history of the Western Hemisphere, beginning the Atlantic slave trade, and unleashing the devastating horrors of conquest on the unsuspecting indigenous Native Americans. Stick around to learn the whole truth of Christopher Columbus. Was he an intrepid explorer, a brilliant navigator, or a greedy invader that took many innocent lives? But before we get into today's video, hit the like, the thumbs up, and subscribe. Christopher Columbus's early life is quite obscure. But scholars predict he was born in the Republic of Genoa in Italy in 1451. His father was a wool weaver and also owned a cheese stand where Columbus worked as his father's helper. When he reached his teens, he got a job on a merchant ship and began his apprenticeship as a business agent for the wealthy families of Genoa and first set out at sea. He remained at sea until 1476, participating in several trading voyages in the Mediterranean and Aegean seas. It was on his very first voyage, however, that French privateers attacked the commercial fleet he was sailing on near the Portuguese coast. In the encounter, the ship burnt down and sunk, but Columbus was fortunate enough to float to the Portuguese shore on a scrap of wood and made his way to Lisbon where he settled down and got married to a woman named Filipa Perestrello. They had a son, Diego. But after his wife's demise, soon afterwards, Columbus moved to Spain, which remained his home for the remainder of his life. Going on several other expeditions over the years to Africa, Columbus gained knowledge of the Atlantic currents flowing east and west from the Canary Islands, studied mathematics, astronomy, cartography, and navigation. In the 15th and 16th centuries, there were many sponsored expeditions sent abroad from Europe in hope that explorers would find great wealth and vast undiscovered lands. The Asian islands near China and India were fabled for their spices and gold, but Muslim domination of the trade routes through the Middle East made it difficult to travel directly through land from Europe to Asia. The Portuguese were the earliest participants in the age of exploration. They solved this problem by taking the sea, sailing small Portuguese ships known as caravels along the West African coast around the Cape of Good Hope, bringing back spices, gold, and slaves of other goods from Asia and Africa to Europe. And Spain, along with many other European nations, wanted a share in these riches. But it wasn't until near the end of the 15th century, with Spain's Reconquista, after centuries of a long series of battles, the Moors, who from the 8th century ruled most of the Iberian Peninsula, were expelled out of their kingdom. Spain finally turned its attention to exploration and conquest in other areas of the world. That's where Columbus comes into the picture. Unlike the Portuguese, Columbus had a different idea. He devised a route to sail west across the Atlantic instead of all the way around Africa saying it was quicker and faster. 
Columbus had a point, but unfortunately, he did his math all wrong. He estimated the Earth to be a sphere, and the distance between the Canary Islands and Japan to be about 2,300 miles, and the journey across the Atlantic through a not yet discovered Northwest Passage was going to be a piece of cake. Columbus's contemporary nautical experts disagreed with his theory and stuck to the now known to be accurate estimate of the Earth's circumference about 25,000 miles, which made the actual distance between the Canary Islands and Japan about 12,200 miles. But who was Columbus to listen? He always thought he was correct. His contemporaries, however, did agree to one point of his, that a westward voyage from Europe would be an uninterrupted water route. Columbus proposed his plan to sail across the Atlantic first to the Portuguese king, King John II, whose experts were wary of his calculations and refused. Three years later, he appealed to King Henry VII of England and King Charles VIII of France, but once again was turned down. The Spanish monarchs Ferdinand of Aragon and Isabella of Castile had too initially rejected him, but when the Spanish army captured the last Muslim stronghold in Granada in January 1492, the king and queen finally agreed to finance Columbus's expedition. A contract was made up between the monarchs and Columbus, called the Capitulations of Santa Fe. According to it, Columbus would be named the admiral, viceroy, and governor of any land he discovered and he would keep 10% of any merchandise, whether pearls, precious stones, gold, silver, spices, and other objects that he acquired within the new territory. So, pretty hyped up about the wealth and power he would gain, Columbus and his crew set sail from Spain in three ships, the Niña, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, which was the larger of the three and on which Columbus was sailing. After 36 days of sailing westward on October 12th, land ahoy! Thinking he found the East Indies, Columbus landed on one of the islands of the Bahamas, likely San Salvador, and claimed it for Spain. First setting foot on the island, Columbus encountered the indigenous people called the Taino. They were friendly towards him and his crew and open to trade jewelry, animals, and supplies with the sailors. But what Columbus was quick to notice was the bits of gold the natives wore as adornments. Now let's not forget why Columbus set sail to begin with. Wealth and power. Over the next few months, Columbus sailed around the islands in the Caribbean, meeting with the leaders of the native populations and looking for his pearls, jewels, golds, and spices. But he didn't find much. Eventually, the Santa Maria ended up getting wrecked on a reef off the coast of the island of Hispaniola. There, with the help of the natives, Columbus built a settlement he called Villa de Navidad, out of lumber from the Santa Maria, and left a group of his men on Hispaniola and set back off to Spain with the other two ships. That is, of course, after he captured some indigenous people to go with him. According to his diary entries, Columbus wrote many things from his journey from Europe to the island, the wildlife, the new animals, but the most intriguing of all entries were those about his encounter with the natives. They brought us parrots and balls of cottons and spears and many other things, which they exchanged for the glass beads and hawk bells. They willingly traded everything they owned. They were well built, with good bodies and handsome features, they do not bear arms, and they do not know of them. For I showed them a sword, they took it by the edge and cut themselves out of ignorance. They have no iron. They would make fine servants. With fifty men, we could subjugate them all, and make them do whatever we want. Back in Spain, Columbus gave a rather exaggerated report to the king and queen, showing off the indigenous people he had abducted, and some spices like pepper, cotton, tobacco, etc but Columbus hadn't found any gold. After about six months, Columbus was sent back to the Americas with 17 ships and supplies to establish permanent colonies in the Americas. But upon arriving to Hispaniola, Columbus found the settlement he had built destroyed and the men left behind killed by the natives after some of them had formed a gang in pursuit of gold and women. 
Columbus then did what he had come to do. To subdue the natives, he ordered public execution of the native leaders. There are reports of a native being brought to the center of the village to have his ears cut off for retribution for the Indians failing to be helpful to the Spaniards when fording a stream. Columbus implemented a labor system that rewarded conquerors with the labor of conquered indigenous people. He and his colonists forced the indigenous people into slavery, including children. The natives were tortured in various ways for the location of imagined gold. They were given a stamped copper or brass token to wear around their necks in what became a symbol of intolerable shame. Oppressed by the impossible requirement to deliver tributes of gold, thousands of natives took their own lives rather than face the oppression. The colonists also had the natives work on plantations. Some natives fled to the mountains to avoid the Spanish troops, only to have dogs set upon them by Columbus's men. Other than the oppression, Columbus and his colonists also brought awful diseases such as smallpox to which the indigenous men and women of the New World had no defense. Between 1494 and 1496, an estimated 100,000 died, half due to mass suicide. In 1508, the population was down to 60,000, and by 1548, it was estimated to be only 500. But despite all Columbus's efforts, he couldn't amass much gold, and so decided to leave his brothers, Bartholomew and Diego, and headed west to continue his mostly fruitless search in what he convinced himself as the outer islands of China. In lieu of the material riches he had promised to the monarchs, Columbus sent back about 500 slaves to Spain. Meanwhile, on his third voyage, Columbus sailed west across the Atlantic. He visited Trinidad and the South American mainland before returning to the Hispaniola settlement where the colonists had staged a bloody revolt against the Columbus brothers' mismanagement and brutality. Columbus had some of his crew executed for disobedience, but conditions became so bad that Spanish authorities had to send a new governor to take over. Accusations of tyranny and incompetence on the part of Columbus reached the court, that Columbus regularly used torture to govern Hispaniola. And so, Christopher Columbus was arrested and returned to Spain in chains. In 1502, although some of the charges might have been alleged by Columbus's enemies, Columbus himself admitted that many of the accusations were true. As a consequence, the Spanish monarch stripped him of his noble titles and much of the riches he made during his voyages. By this point, Columbus was reaching his old age and he requested the king and queen to pay for one last trip across the Atlantic, persuading them that one last voyage would bring them the riches they wanted. This time, Columbus traveled along the eastern coast of Central America, but was yet again unsuccessful in finding a route to the Indian Ocean. He did make it all the way to Panama, however, just miles from the Pacific Ocean. But a storm wrecked two of his four ships on the island of Cuba, which he later had to abandon. During this time, the natives on Cuba, who had enough of the Spaniards' treatments, refused them food. But eventually, a rescue party arrived from Hispaniola and Columbus and his men returned to Spain, empty-handed, once again. In the last two years of his life in Spain, following his last voyage to the Americas, Columbus regained some of the riches he had gathered but he could never recover his lost titles. His health began to fail him when he was plagued with what was thought to be influenza and attacks of gout, but modern doctors say it might have been reactive arthritis from intestinal bacteria or from acquiring some sort of venereal disease. Columbus died at Valladolid on May 20th, 1506, still firmly believing that he had traveled to the western part of Asia but more importantly, leaving behind a controversial legacy. Today we know Columbus never made it to Asia, nor did he truly discover America, but his rediscovery transformed the new world and inspired a new era of exploration and exploitation of the American continents by the Europeans. The Columbian exchange transferred people, animals, food, and disease across cultures. 
Old world wheat became an American staple food. African coffee and Asian sugarcane became cash crops for Latin America. While American foods like corn, tomato, and potatoes were introduced into the European diet. But Columbus's actions also unleashed changes that devastated and decimated the native populations he and his fellow explorers encountered. So the next time you hear someone say, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, you know, Christopher Columbus's expeditions did change both Europe and America forever, but at a heavy cost. If you liked our video, subscribe to our channel, like, and comment down in the section below on which historical figure you would like to hear about next.